Years have passed since Alyssa Burkett's life was tragically cut short. Her daughter Willow has grown up in a loving family, surrounded by the care of her grandparents. Each year on Alyssa's birthday, they visit her grave, remembering her beauty, kindness, and boundless love. The memory of Alyssa lives on in the hearts of her loved ones, in every beat of little Willow's heart. And while the pain of loss will never fade, they know Alyssa will always be with them in their thoughts, actions, and hopes for a better future. Her story is a sad but important reminder of how fragile life is and how important it is to appreciate loved ones while they are close by. Alyssa Ann Burkett was born on the 31st of December, 1995 in Mesquite, Texas to Teresa Ann Burkett and Joshua Forsyth. She had three sisters, Nikki, Madison, and Taylor, and two brothers, Landon and Tyler. From a young age, Alyssa displayed creative inclinations. At the age of seven, she dreamed of becoming a fashion designer and crafting her own clothing. She enthusiastically sketched designs for future outfits. Her grandfather, Russell Forsyth, a songwriter, encouraged his granddaughter's passion and hoped she would continue his legacy. However, at the age of 13, Alyssa changed her plans and decided to pursue a career in law. She explained to her grandfather that she enjoyed arguing and felt a calling in it. Russell supported his granddaughter's choice, albeit mourning about the necessity of diligent study on this path. After graduating from Roy City High School, Alyssa enrolled in a local college. At 18, she discovered she was expecting a child with her boyfriend, Andrew Bird, who was nine years her senior. This unplanned pregnancy caught Alyssa off guard and compelled her to reassess her life plans. Alyssa parted ways with Andrew, deciding to raise her daughter on her own. She dropped out of college and dedicated herself entirely to motherhood. On the 31st of December, 2019, her 24th birthday, Alyssa gave birth to a healthy baby girl whom she named Willow. Despite the challenges, Alyssa strived to be an exemplary mother. Her relatives noted that she wanted to provide her daughter with a stable and loving family, a privilege she was deprived of in her own childhood due to her parents' divorce. On her social media platforms, Alyssa appeared vivacious and open. She shared family photos, thoughts, and interests. Those close to her described her as straightforward, energetic, with a heart of gold and a radiant smile. Alyssa worked tirelessly to provide for her daughter. She was an assistant at a real estate firm and an employee at a management company. At the time of her demise, she was working at Green Tree, a residential real estate company. She was stubborn, determined, sometimes selfish, but you couldn't stay mad at her for long. She had eternal beauty and charm, reminisced her grandfather Russell. He and the entire family were devastated when Alyssa's life tragically ended at the age of 24. Alyssa Burkett met Andrew Bird in her teenage years. He was nine years her senior and appeared as a mysterious bad boy. Despite the protests of her relatives, Alyssa began to court him. The relationship was unstable and complex. Bird did not work and relied on Alyssa for support, yet he was possessive, causing scenes and monitoring every move of the young woman. Friends advised her to break up with him multiple times, but she always returned. In January 2019, 23-year-old Alyssa discovered she was pregnant with Bird's child. She decided to keep the baby, although she doubted Andrew as a future father. Eventually, she left him, choosing to raise her daughter on her own. On December 31st, 2019, Alyssa gave birth to a girl named Willow, with the help of her family, especially her grandparents, she tried to provide her daughter with a peaceful childhood and kept Baird away, deeming him unreliable. However, Baird was unwilling to back down. He initiated a fierce legal battle for custody of Willow, declaring he would achieve his goal at any cost, stating that nothing will stop him. Alyssa feared retaliation from his side. In April 2020, just four months after Willow's birth, a new woman entered Andrew's life, 22-year-old Holly Elkins. Elkins quickly moved in with Bird and began making plans for their life together and raising his daughter. 
The appearance of the young stepmother only intensified the conflict. Elkin saw Alyssa as a rival and actively sought to eliminate her from Bird's life. She positioned herself as the perfect mother for Willow. Alyssa felt a growing threat from her ex-boyfriend and his fiance GC. Friends advised her to be cautious and wary of the worst. Little did she know that her life would soon be cut short by their hands. Shortly after Andrew Bird and Holly Elkin started their relationship, they launched a full-scale campaign to persecute Alyssa Burkett. Their aim was to completely destroy her reputation and strip her of parental rights to gain full custody of Bird's daughter, Willow. In her messages, Elkins openly expressed her obsession with removing Alyssa as a mother. She wrote to Bird that Alyssa controls him, puts him first, and that he must show his submission to his ex and deal with this mess. Elkins insulted Alyssa, calling her a liar, stupid, and a bad mom. She instigated Bird, claiming that Alyssa stood in the way of their happy family life with Willow and urged him to take radical actions. One instance of slander was not enough for Elkins. Together with Bird, they installed a GPS tracker on Alyssa's car, monitoring her every move. Elkins then anonymously called 911, falsely reporting Alyssa for allegedly driving erratically, trying to discredit her to the police. Another time, Elkins went to the police and falsely accused Alyssa's mother of attacking her. To corroborate her story, she even deliberately scratched her own chest. The couple hired a private detective to find dirt on Alyssa and her new partner. Although the investigator found nothing incriminating, Bird and Elkins persisted. In September 2020, they themselves planted drugs and unregistered weapons in Alyssa's car and anonymously informed the police that Alyssa was allegedly dealing drugs from her trunk. During questioning, Alyssa tearfully insisted she had no involvement with drugs. She immediately suspected Bird's involvement, trying to tarnish her in the eyes of child services and the police. Unfortunately, she couldn't prove it. The persecution took on an increasingly menacing tone. A week before the murder, Elkins wrote to Bird, I hope you can handle this. She demanded that he go or die for her, clearly hinting of the impending crime. Unbeknownst to herself, Alyssa was in mortal danger. She had only a few days left to live. Following direct instructions from his fiance GCE Holly Elkins, Andrew Bird began the direct preparation for the murder of Alyssa Burkett. They acted deliberately and methodically, planning every detail of the crime. On September 10, 2020, just three weeks before the tragedy, Elkins accompanied Bird to a sporting goods store. There, he purchased a black raincoat in cash, which he would later use in the attack. Elkins clearly assisted him in selecting suitable attire for the crime. On September 14th, they visited a pharmacy, where Elkins bought dark foundation and other cosmetics for makeup. Evidently, she planned to disguise Bird to hinder his identification by witnesses. Later, the police would find this makeup in Bird's car, along with wipes containing traces of makeup. On September 19th, the couple visited a hardware store where they bought shotgun shells and a large Camillus knife. It was this shotgun and knife that Bird would soon use to carry out his vengeance on the mother of his daughter. Over the past week of September, Elkins inundated Bird with messages, goading him to put the plan into action. She wrote that they needed to deal with this, go or die. Elkins explicitly stated that their relationship would be at risk if he did not follow through to the end. Receiving a clear signal, Bird got down to business. The search history on his phone shows that he began looking for information on how to remove gunpowder residue from his hands after a shot. He clearly did not want to leave any traces. Six days before the attack, Bird bought a used black Ford Expedition advertised. He planned to use it for surveillance on Alyssa and his transportation to the crime scene. The seller later identified Bird as the buyer. A day before the attack, Bird attached a homemade silencer to his .22 caliber pistol. Although he ultimately did not use it in the attack, the mere fact of making the silencer demonstrates the purposefulness of his actions. Finally, on the morning of October 2nd, Bird disguised himself as an African-American, donned a black raincoat, and headed to Alyssa's house in a parked SUV nearby. Thanks to Elkins's messages, he knew the victim's daily routine 
and could anticipate where to find her. The plan was set. Bird and Elkins had considered all the details. They were prepared to ruthlessly execute the mother of one-and-a-half-year-old Willow in broad daylight. There was no turning back. On the morning of October 2, 2020, nothing foreshadowed the tragedy. 24-year-old Alyssa Bouquet, as usual, dropped off her one-and-a-half-year-old daughter Willow at her grandmother's and headed to work at the Green Tree Homes Management Company in Carrollton. She parked her car in front of the office around 9 a.m. and was about to enter the building. At that moment, a black SUV sped towards her car at full speed. A man in a black cloak with a hood and a mask covering his face jumped out of it. In his hands, he held a short-barreled shotgun. Without giving Alyssa time to react, the attacker approached closely and shot her in the head through the side window. Alyssa slumped over the steering wheel, her face and hair drenched in blood. The killer rushed back to his car, intending to flee. However, at that moment, although fatally wounded, Alyssa managed to open the door and almost fall out of the car onto the asphalt. With some incredible force of will, she crawled towards the office door, trying to call for help. A bloody trail followed her. Noticing the movement, Bird swiftly turned around. He pulled out a large hunting knife from under his cloak and lunged towards Alyssa, writhing on the ground. Grabbing her by the hair, he viciously began stabbing her in the neck, chest, and abdomen. In total, Bird inflicted no fewer than 13 stab wounds. From the injuries sustained, Alyssa died on the spot. When her colleagues, hearing the screams, rushed out to the parking lot, they found Alyssa in a pool of blood, her throat slashed. They tried to perform CPR, but in vain. By that time, Bird had already fled in his black SUV, leaving the bloodied knife on the parking lot. Random witnesses described the assailant as a tall, muscular man dressed in all black, with a mask or hood on his head. Many mistook him for an African-American. At the time of the attack, Holly Elkins, according to her own words, was at home with Bird's daughter, Willow. Thus, she had an alibi. Later, she told the police that Bird allegedly was with her all this time, which turned out to be a lie. The brutal daylight murder in a crowded place shocked the residents of Carrollton. They were puzzled about the motives of the criminal. However, Alyssa's relatives and friends immediately suspected Andrew Bird. They were aware of the protracted conflict between the former partners and feared the worst. Alyssa's mother, barely holding back tears, informed the police of her suspicions regarding Bird. She recounted his threats and obsession with her daughter, the prolonged legal battle for custody of her granddaughter. According to her, Bird had repeatedly stated that the living Alyssa Willow would not get. Thus began one of the most shocking and resonant trials in the history of Texas, a trial that made local residents rethink, seemingly, the familiar issue of domestic violence and stalking. The name of Alyssa Burkett will long be remembered as a symbol of maternal love and resilience in the face of cruelty. The investigation into Alyssa Burkett's murder began with questioning witnesses of the crime scene. Alyssa's colleagues detailed the appearance and actions of the assailant. Although he wore a mask, his tall stature and muscular build stood out. Some mistakenly took him for an African-American. The testimonies of Alyssa's relatives about the prolonged conflict with her former partner, Andrew Bird, immediately made him the prime suspect. Friends and colleagues of Alyssa spoke of his obsession, constant surveillance, and threats. Alyssa's new boyfriend recalled that Bird mentioned their full home addresses, although they had not disclosed this information to him. Detectives began surveillance of Bird's house in Rowlett. Soon they noticed Bird, accompanied by his fiancée C.E. Holly Elkins and daughter Willow, carrying suitcases and bags out of the house, clearly preparing to leave for a long time. When Bird got into the car, the police stopped him on the pretext of lacking a license plate. During the search of the car, men's boots cut into pieces and soaked in bleach were found. Also discovered were remnants of camouflage makeup, napkins with makeup, and burnt parts of a brush for its application. In Baird's house, detectives found even more evidence, primarily batteries for GPS trackers that the criminal attached to the cars of Alyssa and her boyfriend. There was also a homemade silencer for a pistol and a whole arsenal of weapons. But the main discovery was a written script that Bird used when calling the police to report drugs in Alyssa's car. The police seized three phones from Baird, including a disposable one, 
In the search history of one of them, there were inquiries on how to remove gunpowder residue from hands. He was clearly trying to cover his tracks. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of the city, an abandoned Black Ford Expedition SUV was discovered. In the cabin, forensic experts found Alyssa's blood and fibers of a fake beard with Andrew's DNA. The car seller identified Bird as the buyer and remembered that he paid in cash and was in a hurry. Forensic examination revealed that the bullet that killed Alyssa was fired from the sawed-off shotgun found in the car. Bird's fingerprints were also found on the handle of a hunting knife. His handwriting was clearly identifiable in the GPS devices and in the calls with false accusations. It seemed that the prosecution had gathered comprehensive evidence of Andrew Bird's guilt. However, the prosecutors also aimed to hold his accomplice, Holly Elkins, accountable. Electronic correspondence between them came to the rescue, showing Elkins' role in planning and inciting the crime. The investigation lasted for several months. During this time, the prosecution meticulously assembled a mosaic of evidence, unequivocally incriminating the ruthless killers of Alyssa Burkett. The jurors were shocked by the cynicism and calculated nature of the criminals. They eagerly awaited the start of the trial to deliver a just verdict. The trial for the murder of Alyssa Burkett began in June 2022, almost two years after the tragedy. Sitting in the dock were 35-year-old Andrew Bird and his 23-year-old fiance Gukka, Holly Elkins. They were charged with stalking, conspiracy, and first-degree murder. From the outset, the prosecutors made it clear that they intended to seek the maximum punishment for both defendants. In their opening statement, they painted a picture for the jurors of a massive conspiracy to take the life of the young mother. The correspondence between Baird and Elkins left no doubt about the meticulous planning of the crime. A key prosecution witness was Christopher Mayo, Alyssa's boyfriend at the time of her death. He told the jurors about months of harassment and persecution orchestrated by Bird and Elkins against them. According to him, Alyssa had mentioned multiple times that Baird seemed like someone capable of killing her. Mayo recounted the phone threats, constant surveillance, and attempts to discredit Alyssa in the eyes of social services and the police. He stated that Elkins was the public master, directing Bird's actions. Her pathological jealousy and obsession with another's child ultimately led to the tragedy. Colleagues and friends of Alyssa shared the grief of the slain mother. Alyssa had confided in them, expressing fear of her unstable ex, feeling constantly watched. A few days before her death, she told a friend, if something happens to me, know that Andrew did it. Forensic experts presented the jurors with a rich arsenal of physical evidence, unequivocally linking Bird to the crime scene. In addition to DNA and fingerprints on the murder weapons, there were traces of gunpowder and disguise fragments in his house and car. However, the nail in the coffin of the trial was the electronic correspondence between Baird and Elkins, eloquently demonstrating their joint plans. Phrases like, I hope you can handle this, do it or die for me. This B asterisk, teach must disappear, littered their messages in the days leading up to the murder. Bird's defense attempted to argue for the lack of premeditation in his actions. Supposedly, he only intended to scare his ex, but in a fit of rage, miscalculated his force. The defense emphasized the emotional distress and stress from the prolonged legal battle, but the correspondence in meticulous preparation for the crime completely refuted these speculations. Particularly telling were Bird's internet searches on removing gunpowder traces. Such actions do not align with those of someone who accidentally turned to violence. Elkins outright denied her involvement, citing an alibi. However, even here, her position was woven with white lies. Messages where she urged her partner to deal with the rival literally put a nail in the coffin of her innocence, at least in incitement. In the end, Bird admitted guilt on the main points. Apparently, he decided to mitigate his fate, avoiding a life sentence. He detailed, albeit quite impassively, the circumstances of the murder, his preparation, and motives. His key motive was an obsession with Willow, his daughter. Elkins stood her ground to the end. Even after the guilty verdict, she continued to proclaim her innocence and the injustice of the sentence. However, this did not help her escape a harsh punishment. 
In May 2023, the judge pronounced the verdict. Andrew Byrd received 43 years in prison, effectively a life sentence. Holly Elkins was sentenced to 20 years for complicity. The courtroom erupted in applause. Justice, albeit delayed, prevailed. The killers of Alyssa Burkett received their due. The loved ones of Alice, with tears in their eyes, expressed gratitude to the prosecutors and jurors. Nothing will bring back our girl, but we are thankful that the guilty have been punished and no one else will suffer at their hands, said Alice's mother to the journalists. This tragedy will serve as a bitter lesson for all victims of domestic violence for a long time. The untimely and cruel death of Alice Burkett shook the residents of Texas in the entire America. A young mother, beloved daughter and sister, she was killed in the most despicable and inhumane manner by the hands of her former partner and the father of her child. Her story became a tragic symbol of the epidemic of domestic violence, claiming thousands of lives annually. Despite the just verdict for the killers, Alice's family does not hide. Their loss is irreplaceable. She was a ray of light in our lives, recalls her mother Teresa. Determined, with a huge loving heart, she lived for her daughter and dreamed of giving her the best. Most painful was the fact that Alice sensed the danger and repeatedly reported it to her loved ones and the police. Alas, no one took her words seriously until it was too late. Perhaps more decisive intervention could have prevented the tragedy. She told me, Mom, he will kill me, I know. But what could I do? The police shrugged, saying, Until he does something, we are powerless. Alice's Aunt Shelley shares in tears. Particular concern arises for Alice's daughter, two-year-old Willow. She lost her mother at such a tender age and will surely not fully grasp the extent of her loss for a long time. Custody of the girl was granted to her maternal grandparents. They vowed to do everything to ensure Willow grows up in love and never forgets her mother. Every day I show her photos of Alice, tell her how wonderful she was. Willow is still young, but she already reaches for the pictures, caressing them with her finger. Despite everything, we will continue to live on, for her, says Alice's grandmother, Teresa Ann. Alice's story raises uncomfortable yet critically important questions. Why do signals of domestic violence victims often go unnoticed? How can we improve the protection and response system to complaints? What prevents us all from being more vigilant about the problems of friends and family? Experts urge early recognition of warning signs of abusive relationships, pathological jealousy, control, isolation from friends and family, outbursts of aggression. Victims need to know they are not alone and can seek help at any time by contacting hotlines or crisis centers. The most important thing is not to remain silent, not to tolerate, not to consider it normal. Violence is never acceptable, and it rarely stops on its own. Alice was strong, but even the strong sometimes need help, emphasizes psychologist Anna Byers, leading a support group for abuse survivors. Alice's death should not be in vain. Her case once again shows how important it is to take threats and signs of violence seriously, especially when the well-being of children is at stake. No family drama is worth a lost life. The name of Alice Burkett will forever remain in the memory of her loved ones and fellow citizens. Her photos and posts on social media continue to gather likes, comments and words of support even years after the tragedy. Many see in her an example of resilience and dedication to loved ones despite all trials. Rest in peace, dear Alice. You will forever remain in our hearts. We will continue your work and love Willow as you loved her. Justice has prevailed, and now you can rest peacefully. We will always remember your goodness, wilt her grandfather Russell on the first anniversary of her death. Perhaps some day in the future, Willow will be able to read these words and learn what an amazing woman her mother was. A woman who fought for her until her last breath and did not let her love fade even in the face of monstrous cruelty. Her short but bright life will forever be an example for all mothers. Alice Burkett's story is not just another criminal chronicle. It is a tragedy of a young woman who only wanted one thing, to love and raise her daughter, but her life was cut short by those who vowed to protect her. Her child's father and his new partner. Obsession, jealousy, desire for control. These were the true motives driving Andrew Bird and Holly Elkins. Neither pleas from Alice, nor fear of the law, 
nor thoughts of the well-being of Little Willow stopped them. In pursuit of a sick passion, they crossed the final line. The most frightening thing is that Alice's case is just the tip of the iceberg. Hundreds of women across the country face domestic violence, harassment, and threats daily. Many are afraid to speak openly about it, considering their burden shameful. Unfortunately, the outcome of this silence can be fatal. Alice's example reminds us, we must not turn a blind eye to signs of abuse in our own lives or the lives of our loved ones. Pathological jealousy is not love, constant control is not care, and outbursts of aggression are not character. These are warning bells, SOS signals that cannot be ignored. If you have become a victim of domestic violence, know that you are not alone. There are people and organizations ready to lend a helping hand. Do not be afraid to take this step. Do not wait until the situation becomes deadly. Your safety and right to a life without fear are paramount above all other considerations. It is our collective responsibility to raise the younger generation in respect and acceptance, to teach them to resolve conflicts with words, not fists or guns, to explain that love does not tolerate violence. Perhaps then our daughters will no longer perish at the hands of those they once let into their hearts. I don't know if Willow will ever understand why and for what her mother died, but I know for sure Alice loved her more than life. Her last thoughts were surely about her daughter. And there, in the heavens, she continues to watch over her little one, said her brother Landon at her funeral. Someday Willow will grow up and be able to read this story herself, the story of her mother's life, love, and struggle. May the memory of Alice be a source of strength and faith in a better future for her. And for all of us, a bitter lesson, a reminder, and a call to action. We owe it to her. We owe it to each other. On September 4th, 1981, 12-year-old Tim Slayton and 15-year-old Jeff Slayton had their childhood abruptly ended when they found their mother, Linda Slayton, dead in her bedroom at their apartment in Lakeland, Florida. She was found lying partially naked, beaten, and with a metal hanger around her neck. Who could have committed such a heinous crime? Could it have been someone close to the family? Or was this a random attack? Today, we're looking into the case of Linda Slayton, a case so twisted, you'll be shocked when you find out who killed her. So without further ado, let's get started. This is Lakeland, Florida, one of the most populous cities in Polk County. Back in 1981, Lakeland was a place with many thriving businesses and residential areas. These residential areas were filled with duplexes, and most belonged to close-knit families that had a lot of young children and toddlers. The area was also filled with lush green grass at every turn, which made the place seem homely. At 303 North Brunel Parkway, the place where Linda and her two boys lived, there were many duplexes. The family even owned one. However, they hadn't stayed there for very long. Sources said that Linda and her two sons moved from Hartzell, Alabama to Lakeland, Florida, two weeks before the incident took place. What could have led to her death? Could it be that she brought an old vengeance to a new place? Linda Patterson Slayton was born on March 8, 1950. By the time she was 16, she was pregnant with her first son, Jeffrey Slayton. Three years later, she gave birth to a second son, Timothy Slayton. Soon after, she managed to convince the father of her two sons, Frank Slayton, to get married so that they could start a proper family. However, a happy family was far from what she got. Frank turned out to be an abusive husband who would routinely abuse her and the two kids. Plagued by his alcoholism and addiction, he would turn violent whenever he got drunk. Jeff and Tim recalled that their father would often turn into the monster. He was a violent alcoholic and would beat the three of them without any conscience. The thought of filing for divorce soon ran through Linda's mind. And in 1974, Linda Slayton finally became free. She divorced Jeff and Tim's abusive father, Frank Slayton, after nine volatile years of their marriage. Linda started her new life as a single mom with two teenage sons. She tried her best to provide for her family and be there for her sons as a caring mother. Juggling work and chores, it was obvious that she had limited financial capabilities. 
They didn't have a car, so her sons, Jeff and Tim, would often go to school either by walking or by sharing rides if they were offered one. Apart from school, Jeff and Tim loved playing football, but since they didn't have a ride to football practice, their coach, Coach Joe, would often pick them up and drop them off at or nearby their home. A week before the 4th of September, Linda was preparing her home to welcome her mother. She wanted her mother to move in since she thought her presence in the house would help get it in order and make it more homely. Her sister, Judy, would also often come by to visit her. During her visits, the sisters would spend their time together over a hot cup of coffee. However, on the 4th of September, 1981, around 8.30 a.m., Judy arrived at Linda's apartment to find something she never expected to see. On the 3rd of September, 1981, the night before the murder, Jeff Slayton came home from football practice. But when he found nothing to eat at home, he headed over to his grandparents' place. Later, at about 9.30 p.m., Jeff reached back home only to find the house empty. Around 11.30 p.m., Linda and Tim, her younger son, came home. She mentioned going to a neighbor's place to play a game of cards. But before that, she settled in to complete her chores and Jeff saw his mum doing the dishes. Tim, on the other hand, went to sleep. Around this time, her son, Jeff, came up to her and apologized since the two had fought earlier that day. As they made up, Linda said goodnight to her boys. Jeff remembers saying these words, I love you, Mom. I'll see you tomorrow. Little did he know, those would be the last words he would say to her. September 4th, 1981. Around 8.30 a.m., Judy arrived at Linda's apartment. She went up to Linda's room and knocked on the door twice. There was no answer. She thought Linda might still be in bed. But it was unusual as Linda usually woke up before the boys left for school. As she made her way out of the house, she noticed something strange. The window in Linda's room had a missing sheet, and on top of that, the window was wide open. Judy returned to Linda's room, knocked again, and this time opened the door to find Linda Slayton's a lifeless body. She screamed. This caught the attention of a caretaker near the house, and he immediately called 911. Linda was found dead with a wider clothes hanger around her neck. Her body was partially naked, and she lay right across the bed with her head down on the floor. There were no signs of struggle. Her cupboard was wide open. Apart from that, all the other things in her room were in their usual places. Within a matter of minutes, the Lakeland police, news reporters, and medical services all arrived. The yellow sign reading, Crime Scene, Do Not Enter, was plastered all over Linda's home. Tim and Jeff were both awakened by police officers and were asked to leave their home, which was now a crime scene. While Jeff was able to get past his mother's room without seeing her lifeless body, Tim saw his mother one last time. But this time, she wasn't alive. The two were then sent to live with their grandparents pending further investigation. Linda was 31 years old when she was murdered. As soon as her sons, Tim and Jeff, were sent away to their grandparents, Sergeant Edgar Pickett from the Lakeland Police Department arrived at the crime scene. He was the one who not only led the case, but also found crucial evidence of the crime scene. At the beginning of the investigation, Sergeant Edgar found a few prints in Linda's bedroom. Most of the prints belonged to the deceased Linda Slayton. However, there was one print that didn't belong to her. It was a palm print. The palm print was found on Linda's bedroom windowsill. It was the same windowsill that had a missing window sheet. To find out what really happened to Linda Slayton, she was taken for an autopsy. There, they found several marks and bruises around her arms, shoulders, and neck. Also, when her body was found, she was partially naked, which may have been evidence of sexual assault. After running the autopsy, it was determined that she had been brutally beaten at first, then sexually assaulted and then strangled to death with a metal clothes hanger from her own cupboard. Of the evidence found, the palm print was the most crucial, as it could identify the culprit on the spot with a match. But forensic DNA analysis didn't exist back then. In order to determine who might have been responsible, the police were forced to overlay her entire family tree. The first suspect was Frank Slayton, Linda's ex-husband. Back in 1975, at the time she divorced Frank, Linda stated that he had an aggressive nature. 
he was abusive and did not take care of his family. It was no doubt that he would be deemed a person of interest in this case. He was taken in for questioning. However, when the officials looked into his whereabouts the night Linda was killed, they found that he was at home in Alabama. Even then, they remained suspicious of him. The second suspect was Linda's own son, Jeff Slayton. But why did the officials think of him as a suspect? Well, before Linda was killed, Jeff Slayton had a heated argument with his mother. Jeff had a very close yet distant relationship with his mother. He, being the eldest son, felt the pressure of living in a family with an abusive father and later with a single mom. There were certain times when Jeff and his mother would often get on each other's bad side, but he always made sure to make up for it. On the night of the murder, Jeff made up with his mother before going to bed. The police questioned him about the incident. They even told him to take two polygraph tests. What he passed, the police cleared him from the list of suspects. The third suspect was Linda's boyfriend. At the time, Linda, a single mom, had started dating someone. The white male, who remains unnamed, had a close relationship with her and her kids. However, when police ran a background check and polygraph tests, he was cleared. By this time, they were running out of suspects until, by September 2001, they got a tip. Almost a year after Linda was murdered, there was a rumor about a 24-year-old man who committed a similar crime. His name was Jimmy Ulmer. At the time, he was linked to a crime where he pulled a 10-year-old girl through her bedroom window and nearly killed her. When the police ran a check on him, they found that he was convicted of 80 years to prison time. Also, the fact that his crimes and Linda's case were strikingly similar. To top it off, at the time of the murder, Jimmy was found staying in the same apartment complex as Linda did. The evidence found against him made the police think he was the prime suspect. But there was a downside. Jimmy had died while the investigation was going on, so it wasn't possible for a DNA match. That would mean they'd have to dig up his body to perform the test. Luckily, Jimmy's mother allowed a DNA test and got his sample. However, once the results came back, there was no match. If it wasn't for the family or the next-door convict, who could have killed Linda? By this time, the days had turned into weeks and then months. In Lakeland, detectives looked at other people as well, but no one was ever charged. And without any new leads, the case turned cold. The Slayton brothers had to face a new reality in life. Their mother was gone, and they had only their grandparents, Clarence and Margaret Harris. While the investigation was going on, Linda's parents and sons held a funeral for her, and soon after, they started to get back to living their lives and regular routines. The brothers went back to school. As time passed, they started to move on from what happened back up 303 North Burnell Parkway. Tim got back into playing football. He even recalls to this day that his teammates and coach were very supportive. When he didn't have a ride back home to his grandparents, Coach Joe would still take him to and from practice. A month later, Tim hung a photograph of his team on his bedroom wall. To him, that picture gave him the motivation to pull past it all and move forward. In the years that followed, the young brothers who just lost their mother grew into men who cared and loved for their own families. Jeff got married and went on to have two children. Tim also got married and started a family. As time went by, both brothers would frequently check in with the Lakeland investigators to see what kind of progress was being made on their mom's case. Jeff Slayton still recalls the night that Linda was murdered. I didn't hear anything, and it's so hard to live like that. Even Linda's neighbors stated that they didn't hear anything unusual the night she was murdered. Despite the fact that Jeff and Tim had each created successful lives for themselves, they made sure that the case was moving forward. Tim reveals this in an interview, saying, No matter how many detectives we had to go through over here, we were going to let them know we're still here, and we want to know who killed our mom. Seventeen years had passed since Linda's passing. But despite the passage of more than a decade, the police persisted in their investigation. By 1998, Sergeant Edgar Pickett had left his position, and the Slayton case was assigned to the new investigation team. Detective Brad Grace was assigned to this case. While going through the pieces of evidence, 
he found unidentified DNA from the Slayton case that had been collected back in 1981. He sent this to the state's major crime lab at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, also known as the FDLE. By 1999, the crime lab at the FDLE was able to break down and develop a full DNA profile of Linda Slayton's unknown killer. After receiving the DNA profile, he then ran through the list of suspects once again. This time, he was determined to get DNA samples from each one. The year was 2001, and Detective Grice thought that the DNA profile match would definitely reveal the murderer. He made certain to speak with the Slayton brothers first. Soon, he managed to arrange a meeting with them. When the brothers arrived, Detective Grice collected their DNA samples and sent them for further testing. When the results came back, there was no match. Soon after, Jeff's name was completely cleared from the case. Frank Slayton was the next subject of investigation. At this point, Frank had given up drinking. Over the years after Linda's passing, he appeared to have lost some of his aggressive and abusive tendencies. Tim and Jeff were also able to meet their father during this time and mend some of the wounds from the past. Frank agreed to send his DNA for testing. The DNA, however, did not match the hypothetical unidentified DNA profile that the detective believed would point to the murderer. Detective Grice submitted the unidentified DNA profile from the Slayton case to the FBI's National DNA Database in 2005, where it was continually cross-referenced with newly submitted DNA samples. He eliminated dozens of suspects through the course of his investigation using DNA evidence. However, he retired in 2015 after spending 17 years on the Slayton case. After Detective Grice, the Slayton case was assigned to new detectives Tommy Hefcock and Russell Hurley. Detective Tammy learned three years into the investigation that the FDLE had developed a groundbreaking technology that could help in identifying any unidentifiable DNA. Taking advantage of the chance, the detective sent Cece Moore, a genetic genealogist who worked for the FDLE, the unidentified DNA from the Slayton case. The public genealogy website Jednach, which is run by Cece Moore, produced a list of people who shared DNA with the unidentified killer after she uploaded the anonymous DNA from the Slayton case there. She then used birth certificates, marriage certificates, obituaries, and social media to create a genetic family tree. As the investigation went deeper, Moore created three family tree branches for the murderer, which helped her identify the one person who was most likely to be responsible for the killing of Linda Slayton. The family tree built off the DNA profile showed that he was almost certainly the person who murdered Linda Slayton. It was here that the twist got so bizarre that it even shocked Tim and Jeff Slayton. This was the picture that hung on Tim's bedroom wall and the person just above his shoulder was Joseph Clinton Mills, often called Coach Joe. The family tree built off the DNA profile showed that he was almost certainly the person who murdered Linda Slayton. After learning the killer's name, Detective Tammy and Russell got on with Joseph Mills' background check. They then uncovered some crimes committed by him. One of them was committing grand theft by forging a will. Even though he was never charged for it, the police did get his palm and fingerprints. And, as you may recall, Sergeant Edgar Pickett had discovered a palm print on the windowsill at the crime scene. This meant that the family of the deceased might finally receive closure in the cold case, which had been open for more than 40 years at this time. Investigators compared the palm prints taken in 1981 from Linda Slayton's windowsill to Mills's palm print, and they discovered a match. But detectives still needed to compare a recent DNA sample from the suspect to the DNA from the Slayton case, despite their conclusions. So they made the decision to obtain his DNA for testing without his knowledge. They did this by taking garbage bags from Joseph Mills's house and searching them at the police station for items that could have his DNA. While sorting out the trash, they found a piece of medical adhesive tape in one of the bags that they sent to the crime lab for testing. The detectives looked into Mills's private life in more detail while they awaited the DNA results. He'd spent the majority of his 58 years in Kathleen, Florida, which was only 30 minutes from the crime scene. He had children and grandchildren and was married as well. The results from the crime lab, which were obtained almost two weeks later, showed that the unknown DNA that was found 
and Nilsa's DNA on the medical adhesive tape were an exact match. In December 2019, detectives arrested Mills and brought him in for questioning. Back in 1981, Joseph Mills was just around 20 years old when he committed the crime. Just one day after the murder, police also spoke to him, but it was over the phone. During the brief call, Mills told investigators that he dropped him off after football practice on September 3, 1981, the night before the murder, but police never considered him a suspect. Mills said to the cops during his questioning that Linda Slayton had allegedly invited him over for consensual sex, but the detectives were aware that this was a fabrication. They concluded that he targeted her even before the night of the murder, as he was often seen picking up Tim for football practice and dropping him off at home after practice. Also, the fact that he stayed near the Slaytonists was a matter of suspicion. So what actually happened on the night of September 3, 1981? According to Mills' statement, Mills had just dropped him off at his house after football practice. Later that evening, when no one was home, he returned and broke in through Linda's bedroom window. He then waited for her to go to bed while hiding in her closet. That's when he beat, sexually assaulted, and finally strangled Linda with a wire hanger from her closet. Joseph Mills pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and sexual battery. At his sentencing, Members of Linda Slayton's family confronted him and demanded to know why he killed her. What is Lord Allah? Why did they follower All Mills told the court was, I am a good person, and they didn't receive a response or an apology from him. Mills was given a life sentence in prison without the chance of parole by the judge. Even though the Slayton brothers take some solace from the knowledge that Nils will never skate from prison alive. They're enraged by the fact that he enjoyed all those years of freedom while they spent the majority of their lives without their mother. For Tim, it was something totally unexpected since Coach Joe was a role model for him back in the day. Tim also stated that Mills would often ask him about the case. He'd ask if there was any progress in finding the culprit, but to keep himself off the radar, he extended his help in making it easy for the boys during football practice. He'd asked us how the case was going. He wouldn't ask questions about it. He just, what is any new news or any new leads? And I was like, no, nothing, you know. To this day, Tim doesn't actually believe that his mother's killer was actually the person he trusted the most. Tim even says, I've been carrying the killer's picture in my house at this table the whole time and never had a clue. Jeff, who was completely bereaved, still thinks about what life might have been if Linda were still alive. Tim and Jeff remain extremely close after this incident. They frequently visit their mother's grave, and Jeff always lights a candle on the anniversary of her passing. Despite all that's happened to them, they've never stopped trying to live life to the fullest for their mother. Forty years ago, an American teenager was found bludgeoned to death in a cemetery in New Jersey. Her face was so badly injured that it was impossible to identify her at the time. The American public began to refer to her as Princess Doe, the Jane Doe who had died too young. For four decades, her real name has been a mystery. Until now. Hi, and welcome to Mysterious 7. I'm Michael, and today's episode, I'm going to take you guys through the story of how Princess Doe was killed, how her identity was revealed, and how her killer was finally caught. Let's get right into it. Princess Doe was a previously unidentified American teenager from West Babylon, New York. She was found murdered in Cedar Ridge Cemetery in Blairstown, New Jersey, on the 15th of July, 1982. Her face had been bludgeoned beyond recognition. Her case gained national attention and the public took a special interest in unraveling her story and finding answers. She became the first unidentified dead body to be entered into the National Crime Information Center. On the morning of Thursday, July 15, 1982, at around 8 a.m., gravedigger George Kyes discovered the body of a young girl in the rear section of the Cedar Ridge Cemetery in Blairstown, New Jersey. The body was found lying on its back, just over a steep bank that leads to a creek below. The victim's face had been beaten beyond recognition with a yet-to-be-determined object. Due to the significant decomposition of her body, even her eye color could not be confirmed. The young girl was dressed in a red short-sleeve shirt. A peasant-style skirt was found lying on top of the victim's legs. No footwear or undergarments were found. 
No conclusive evidence what was found, but this was difficult to determine because of how much the body was decayed. A golden cross necklace was found tangled in the victim's hair. Two earrings were found in her left ear. Red nail polish was found on the right hand only, and she had no surgical scars, distinct birthmarks, or tattoos. Scars or marks on the head or face area could not be known due to the condition of the body. Forensic anthropologists determined that the victim was not pregnant and had never given birth, and was most likely between the ages of 18 and 14 years old at the time of her death. Toxicology did not reveal any traces of drugs, but was not entirely conclusive because of the time elapsed between the death and the discovery of the body. It is believed that the body was discovered after two to three days, or possibly even weeks, of exposure to the elements. This was especially difficult to determine because of the hot and humid weather in the area at that time. The forensic examination indicated that the girl had attempted to fight back or defend herself from her attacker, as injuries indicating trauma to her hands and arms were visible. The girl's body was buried in the Cedar Ridge Cemetery, not far from where she was discovered in January 1983. Donated funds were used to pay for the victim's coffin and headstone. The headstone was engraved with the text, Princess Doe, missing from home, dead among strangers, remembered by all. For many years, Princess Doe was thought to be Diane Janice Guy, a missing teenager from San Jose, California, who vanished on July 30, 1979. His theory was propagated by several law enforcement officials in the state of New Jersey, who went as far as to hold a press conference identifying Diane Dai as Princess Doe. However, Lieutenant Eric Kranz, the Princess Doe case's original lead investigator, maintained that Diane Dai was not a viable candidate for Princess Doe's identity. Kranz's feelings were shared by Diane's family and investigators in California, who were particularly angered by the conduct of the New Jersey law enforcement. In 2003, Princess Doe's DNA was compared with a DNA sample from Diane's mother, Patricia, and it was conclusively determined that Princess Doe was not Diane Dye. After seeing images of the girl's clothing in the newspaper, a witness named Anne-Marie Latimer reported to officials that she remembered seeing a girl wearing the same clothing as Princess Doe purchasing cigarettes on July 13, 1982, just two days before her body was found. Latimer stated that she was shopping with her daughter at a supermarket across from the cemetery and observed and was able to describe the victim's clothing. The shirt and skirt themselves were traced to a manufacturer in the Midwestern United States, although the brand labels were missing. Three people reported, after viewing the photos, that they had bought similar clothes at a Long Island store, which is now closed. On September 22, 1999, the body of Princess Doe was exhumed from the Cedar Ridge Cemetery in Blairstown so that DNA samples could be taken. The body was reburied in the same location. After a 2012 photo composite of the victim was released, it generated new tips as it resembled several missing girls from across the country. One theory was submitted that Princess Doe may have been a runaway and could have been an individual using false names while employed at a hotel in Ocean City, Maryland. In 2012, a sample of her hair and a tooth were examined through isotope analysis and indicated that the victim was most likely born in the United States, at least seven to 10 months in the Midwestern or Northeastern United States. The tooth sample indicated she could be from Arizona. It is also believed that the girl had spent a long time in Long Island, New York. Lieutenant Krams, now retired, coined the name Princess Doe early in the investigations and also managed to get the case covered extensively in the media. The case was used as the impetus for recording unidentified crime victims in the MCIC database at the national level. Princess Doe became the first such case entered by the FBI director. After extensive print media coverage in 1982, Lieutenant Krams, who was the original lead investigator from the Blairstown Police Department, was contacted by HBO regarding the Princess Doe case and asked if the channel could chronicle the case in an upcoming documentary entitled Missing. Kranz agreed and the segment was filmed over several weeks. Kranz was shown following leads as they came in. The documentary featured actual footage of the recovery of Princess Doe's body, along with footage shot by HBO of Princess Doe's 1983 funeral. The case was also featured on America's Most Wanted in 2012 in hopes of generating new information about the case. The same year, the most recent reconstruction was broadcast on CNN. 
On July 15, 2012, a memorial service was held for the 30th anniversary of Princess Doe being discovered at the top of the ravine where her remains were found. Over 100 citizens attended, as well as several reporters and cameras. The victim's clothing, as well as her photo reconstructions, were on display for public viewing. On October 12, 2014, Princess Doe was honored at a missing persons rally in the area. In the years between the first discovery in the body and the final identification, several theories cropped up. The first one was that Princess Doe was actually Diane Dye, a young girl missing from California, which has now been definitively disproved. Secondly, the killer of Princess Doe was already imprisoned for another homicide. A man called John Reese was briefly suspected as he was convicted of killing another woman in nearby Belvedere, New Jersey. But there was no real evidence of a connection with Princess Doe. The third theory was that Princess Doe was either a runaway that was known to work in the Ocean City, Maryland area, or a prostitute who worked at the local truck stop. The information for these two possibilities was highly inconclusive. Nobody from the local area came forward to identify Princess Doe on or off the record. It seems unlikely that not one single person would come forward if she was known in the area. The fourth and disturbing theory was that Princess Doe was killed by a Blairstown police officer, and that is why the case was never solved. But this claim is completely unsubstantiated. There are retired local law enforcement officers who still follow and contribute to the case, even after 40 years. The fifth theory was that Princess Doe was a victim of a serial killer known to operate in the area, such as John Kleiss, Henry Lee Lucas, or Jill Rifkin. Though local law enforcement was aware of these claims, none were found to be credible. A sixth theory was that Princess Doe was an out-of-state teenager who worked at an area camp. Again, this was never proven. And now we come to the seventh theory, that Princess Doe was killed by a man named Arthur Kinlaw. For many years, this was the most current theory. Many of the facts fit the case, and this theory was explored on the America's Most Wanted website. Several New York Newsday articles reference this theory that was published in 1999 and 2000. Mr. Kinlaw was already in prison for other crimes, but since Princess Doe's body wasn't identified, his involvement in her murder could not be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Princess Doe's body was re-exhumed in November 2020 using a grant, and she underwent DNA extraction for genetic genealogy. In May 2021, investigators were notified by the NCMEC, or National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who were collaborating with Astria Forensics about obtaining DNA markers from degraded samples of Princess Doe's body using a grant. On June 18, 2021, investigators received the news that Astria Forensic agreed to extract DNA and construct a DNA profile. On February 10, 2022, Astria Forensics relayed to investigators that the creation of a DNA data file was successful. The results were sent to the NCMEC's consulting genealogist from Innovative Forensics Investigations. The managing officer was Jennifer Moore, who agreed to perform unlimited genealogy testing free of charge. On February 22, 2022, Innovative Forensics announced to investigators that they had found a candidate for Princess Doe, Investigators went to West Battle on New York, where they met Robert Olenek Jr., Princess Doe's brother. They also collected a DNA sample from Princess Doe's sister, which mitotyping technology used to build a mitochondrial DNA profile. The Union County Prosecutor's Office Forensic Laboratory assisted by creating an STR DNA profile through the victim's sister's DNA sample. Mitotyping technology sent their results to the Union County Prosecutor's Office Forensic Laboratory then sent both the mitochondrial DNA and STR DNA profiles to the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification. On April 29, 2022, the center identified Princess Doe as Don Olenek. Her identity was formally announced on July 15, 2022, the 40th anniversary of her discovery. Robert Olenek Jr. said that Olenek left their home at her mother's request and she was never seen or heard from again. Way back in 1999, evidence came to light that Arthur and Donna Kinlaw may have been involved in Princess Doe's murder. Donna was arrested in California for attempting to commit welfare fraud by using the name Eliana, which was traced to a Long Island native. When the police questioned her, she gave them details about the murder of Linda, and her testimony put the Kinlaws behind bars. 
Donna gave details about two murders Arthur had committed of two other female victims who remain unidentified today. After Arthur was faced with a death sentence, Donna told authorities that Kinlaw had killed another woman, a sex worker, earlier in 1982. She told police that she was with Arthur in the cemetery and witnessed him commit the murder. Another report states that Donna Kinlaw said that in July 1982, her husband brought home a teenage girl, left home, and returned without her. He later apparently disposed of his clothing and cleaned his vehicle. Afterward, he threatened his wife, claiming if she did not attend her job, he would take her life as he did to the girl he brought home. However, a lack of cooperation meant that Arthur Kinlaw was not charged. Lieutenant Stephen Spears, who worked on the case as a member of the Warren County Prosecutor's Office, from which he is now retired, stated that Kinlaw claimed responsibility for her death, but I have no physical evidence to confirm that. And without the identity of Princess Doe, I have no way of connecting the dots, so to speak, putting her in a place where he could have been or would have been at the same time. Spears also reported that he doubted the confession because the Kinlaws could not provide a name for Princess Doe, even though they claimed to have been with her for some time. Even though he questioned the credibility of their statements, Spears does not believe the victim was native to Long Island, New York. However, Donna Kinlaw was interviewed by a forensic artist who created a sketch of the girl she claimed to have met, which does resemble the most recent composite. Arthur Kinlaw remained incarcerated for two counts of second-degree murder. Following the 2022 investigation of Princess Doe as Don Olenek, Arthur Kinlaw was reconsidered as a suspect and later charged with Olenek's murder. Don Olenek was born on August 5, 1964. She had been a junior at Conaquat High School in Bohemia, New York where she had lived with her mother and sister, authorities said. But she soon moved out of the family home. According to her brother, she was thrown out of her home by her mom. She ended up getting killed in a cemetery, leaving no clue as to her real identity. But for more than 20 years, the name of her suspected killer was no secret. In 1999, the wife of Arthur Kinlaw, the convicted pimp who today is serving time for the murder of many other Long Island women, tied her husband not only to those deaths, but to the brutal slang of the girl in the Blairstown Cemetery. In an interview with Newsday at the time, Donna Kinlaw recounted how her husband in the summer of 1982 brought a girl of about 18 years old back to their central Islip home. Her. She told the newspaper as well as police that her husband left with the woman but later returned home alone, appearing shaken. About two weeks later, according to Newsday, she read that police in Belvedere, New Jersey, had found the body of a dead girl who fit the description of the girl who was in their house that night. He kept saying, what does it say? What does it say? Does it say who the person was who got killed? She said her husband asked. From the story she read aloud to her husband, Donna Kinlaw told Newsday that she remembered that the New Jersey police named the dead girl Princess Jane Doe. Not long afterward, investigators exhumed her body to recover the murder victim's femur bone in hopes of using her DNA to identify her. And in fact, investigators acknowledged that Arthur Kinlaw confessed to the New Jersey murder in written statements dating back to 2005. But it was not until April of this year that Don Olinit was positively identified. Arthur Kinlaw, now 68, is currently imprisoned in Sullivan County, New York on two other first-degree murder convictions from 2000. Among them was a teenager he knew only as Linda in April 1984 in the Bronx, Newsday reported. I strangled her with my hands, said Kinlaw. She was hit about the head by me with a bat. Arthur Kinlaw has now been charged with one count of homicide as the result of the subsequent investigation, witness statements, and his confession of Olenek's murder. It is believed that after Don Olenek refused his demands to go into prostitution, he drove her to New Jersey. They both ended up in Blairstown, where Kinlaw murdered her in the Cedar Ridge Cemetery. Neither Olenek nor Kinlaw had a connection with the town. Kinlaw remains imprisoned at the Sullivan Correctional Facility in Fallsburg, New York. Investigators are now looking to piece together Don Olenek's movements in the time leading up to her death. The DNA Doe Project also DNA Doe Project Incorporated, or DDP, is an American nonprofit volunteer organization formed to identify unidentified deceased persons, more commonly known as John or Jane Doe, by using forensic genealogy. Their volunteers identified victims of automobile accidents, homicides, and unusual circumstances, such as persons who committed suicide under an alias. 
The group was founded in 2017 by Colleen Fitzpatrick and Margaret Press. Unraveling the mystery of Princess Doe has been a sensational success for genealogical DNA testing of exactly this kind. Sometimes the smallest things make the biggest impact. And for the case of Princess Doe, that was exactly what happened. A molar root weighing just 200 kilograms would hold the answers that had eluded investigators for close to 40 years. With the help of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, Princess Doe's molar and eyelash were submitted to Astria Forensics in 2021 for possible DNA extraction. What is so special about Astria is that they can extract DNA from samples that are degraded or otherwise would provide no value, said Carol Schweitzer, a forensic supervisor at NCMEC. We knew that if anyone could get the information that was needed, Astria could. And they did. Kelly Kincaid, CEO of Astria Forensics, told NCMEC that they were lucky to find that the DNA was exceptionally well-preserved and allowed for millions of pieces of information to be gathered to complete the DNA profile. This single DNA extract contained hundreds of millions of unique human DNA fragments, said Kelly. With these sequencing data, we were able to reconstruct her whole genome single, nucleotide polymorphisms, or SMP, profile. This resulted in Astria being able to deliver genotype files to NCMEC and the Warren County Prosecutor's Office that could go on and be used to complete Princess Doe's genealogy. This technology that would not have been possible 40 years ago was just the break the investigators had been hoping for to identify Princess Doe's identity. Once Astria finished the sequencing, Innovative Forensic Investigations, or IFI, started to work on investigative genetic genealogy techniques to build a family tree that would ultimately lead to the true identity of Princess Doe, or who we now know as Don Olenek. This work was only possible because of the collaborative effort of each agency, said Jennifer Moore, CEO of IFI. Our team brings forward a diverse set of skills that allows us to help find answers to cases. Echoing Moore's sentiment in today's press conference, Prosecutor Pfeiffer reiterated that science and technology made the impossible possible in this case. Don's case was deeply personal for the investigators involved, and their push for answers and justice never wavered. Don's family expressed deep gratitude to everyone who worked to find answers in Don's case. This is a very big deal for my family, said Don's cousin. I'd like to thank Blair Stant for treating my cousin like she was one of their own. It touches our family deeply. My cousin is always in my heart, he said while tapping the photo of Don pinned to his chest. Blairstown gave it to her and it gave up. We were greatly appreciative of that. Since Princess Doe was the first unidentified person's case to be entered into NCIC, the National Crime Information Center, by the director of the FBI, William Webster, on June 30th, 1983, this was a historic moment for missing and unidentified persons that has continued to play a crucial role in investigations since. The entry in NCIC has remained current and alive until today when she will be removed. The tenacity of law enforcement has never stopped, and they continue to pour resources and new technology into solving this case. And it's thanks to the collaboration between police authorities and genealogical DNA testing experts that Princess Doe was publicly identified on the 40th anniversary of the discovery of her body as Don Olenek. So, what do you guys think about this 40-year-old case finally getting resolved? Do you still have any theories about Princess Doe? Let us know in the comments section.